Hello everyone. My name is Paula Fogel and I'm a sophomore at Cornell University studying microbiology. Today, I'd like to tell you about one of the most important parts of a bacterium in terms of disease and immunity. I'm talking, of course, about bacterial pili. Pili are small hair-like structures that grow on the outside of bacterial cells. There are two main types of pili. The first is conjugative pili, which allow bacteria to mate and exchange beneficial DNA with each other. One of the most well-known traits exchanged in this way is that coding for multi-drug antibiotic resistance. However, it's the second type of pilus that plays a larger role in disease. In fact, the main difference between a pathogenic and a non-pathogenic strain of a bacterium is often that the pathogenic one has pili and the non-pathogenic one doesn't. Let's look at Vibrio cholerae, the bacterium responsible for cholera, as an example of the power of the pilus. V. cholerae causes disease by binding to human intestines and releasing a toxin that causes water to flush the digestive system. That is why cholera causes its characteristic gastrointestinal symptoms. Being expelled in a liquid medium that other organisms may contact is, of course, a great way for the bacterium to spread. Since cholera toxin production is so beneficial, one might expect that all of the Vibrio cholerae would want to be able to produce it, right? However, only two strains of Vibrio cholerae can cause disease. What sets them apart from the others? You guessed it. The pathogenic strain has pili. So what is it about pili that can make a good bacteria go bad? First, bacteria without pili are unable to bind to the walls of the intestine. Bacteria need to be able to bind body tissue in order to replicate enough to cause disease. No pili means no binding. So even if you ingested large quantities of a non-piliated strain of the cholerae, they wouldn't be able to colonize you. Now, Here's where it gets even more interesting. Most strains of E. cholerae don't have the gene to produce cholera toxin either. So where did the pathogenic strains get it? It turns out that the cholera toxin gene was introduced to the pileated strains by a pili binding virus. Some viruses reproduce by injecting their genome into a bacterium's genome and allowing the bacteria to replicate its DNA over many generations. This is how the cholera virus works. It injects its entire genome, including the toxin gene, into the bacterium, and then future generations produce the toxin when they produce the gene that makes their pili. To sum up, pili give V. cholerae the two things it needs to be pathogenic. They allow the bacteria to bind to human intestines, meaning that they can replicate enough to cause infection, and it allows the virus carrying the toxin gene to bind the bacterial cell and infect it. As a reminder, this is beneficial for both the bacterium and the virus because it gives them an easy, albeit gross, way to come in contact with new organisms to infect. Ironically, the same genes that make the cholerae pathogenic may also be key to preventing infection effectively. Current cholera vaccines use whole dead bacteria, even though dead bacteria don't express pili like live pathogenic ones do. In addition, these vaccines can also cause nasty side effects, and at best, they're only 80% effective. However, scientists hope that by making vaccines that target pili, and therefore pathogenic bacteria only, they may be able to increase the efficacy of the vaccine while reducing side effects. I guess pili may have some redeeming characteristics after all.